For the past five years, I have documented aircraft emitting trails across the sky. I have taken hundreds of videos and thousands of photographs of these persisting emissions. Many of the aircraft I have witnessed appear to be spraying something into the atmosphere. Uneasy with my observations, I wanted to know exactly what was causing the aircraft to leave, leave visible trails that did not dissipate. I reached out to local, state, and federal government agencies for information and assistance. What I experienced was disillusioning, to say the least. When I called the EPA, I was told that the FAA handled aircraft emissions. When I called the FAA, they call, told me to call the EPA. I was shuttled from office to office with no agency ever accepting responsibility or accountability. My calls were not returned, nor were my concerns ever addressed. The sage advice I finally received from, an EPA, from the EPA was to hire a plane and do my own testing. This was especially disheartening since I had been led to believe that the Environmental Protection Agency was the ultimate protector of the environment. Additionally, the EPA advised me to contact the Department of Environmental Quality for the state of Virginia. Not surprisingly, the DEQ informed me that they do not regulate mobile sources of emissions, don't go to airports, and don't check what is being loaded on planes. As for my request for my yard to be tested for heavy metal, chemical, or biological contamination, I was told that the Virginia DEQ could not use state money to test for those materials. Furthermore, my complaint was in an area that they had no authority to investigate, another dead end. I reported Naval, Station, Naval Air Station Oceana military jets for dumping fuel over my neighborhood and spoke with at least 30 individuals at the base. I finally spoke with Terry Chamberlain, head of the environmental office at Oceana. Mr. Chamberlain bluntly informed me that the military regulates itself. Needless to say, they continue to dump unburnt fuel over the residents living close to the base. For several years, I electronically reported on airplane pollution using the environmental violations form on EPA's website, epa.gov tips. It was referred to me by an ASRC federal contractor working for the EPA. I have always included my contact information on the tip report and identified specific aircraft that can easily be traced. No one from the EPA has investigated any of my formally filed complaints. Since I became interested in the possible dangers of chemical spraying in the environment, I have contacted the Virginia Pollution Control Board, National Weather Service, Oceana and Damneck military bases, NOAA, NASA, the Department of Defense, Brookhaven National Laboratory, the Department of Energy, the Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, the Health Department, the Department of Travel, countless federal agents and operators, the Virginia Beach Police Department, and even the White House, all to no avail. To date, no one from any agency has investigated my complaints. I was told to talk to my local representatives. Every agency I contacted responded to my reports by telling me that I was seeing condensation from engine exhaust. Aircraft engines do emit water vapor, of course, but vapor that quickly dissipates. What I was witnessing was persistent and long-lasting. How can anyone reasonably conclude that a particular aircraft emission is merely a contrail without testing it? That is both unscientific and irresponsible. Chemtrails, as opposed to contrails, is the term used to describe persistent aircraft emissions. There is a rising international concern about the existence of airborne chemical spraying bolstered by a growing body of scientific evidence. What is in the air that we are breathing? One chemtrail activist from California decided to have, excuse me, decided to have his hair tested for heavy metals at his own expense. High levels of strontium and barium were uncovered. I have a copy of his lab results that he voluntarily sent to me. I will post this document on my Facebook page, Madison Star Moon, following this hearing. Did this contamination come from chemical spraying? How can we know if local, state, and federal agencies refuse to take ownership of the issue to provide testing and usable data and ultimately regulate when required? The whole burden of investigation cannot rest with the EPA. It must be shared with other agencies in Congress. However, there must be clear lines of authority so that the public is fully informed and protected. 
The stated purpose of this hearing is to consider the full range of pollution generated by aircraft. The desire for investigation into chemical spraying has become a worldwide phenomenon. We are counting on you as the protectors of the environment to act. No more runarounds for citizens deeply concerned about the health of the world and the individuals that inhabit it. Thank you. Schemes proposed ranging from zany to pretty low tech. And they all have to do with getting aerosols into the stratosphere and keeping them there for years and years and years. So for example, if we used existing technology, if we used aircraft, this would be the equivalent of taking a small airline and just saying, you do nothing but spray aerosols in the stratosphere for the next 10 decades. So right there, his first example of using existing technology to put these aerosols into the sky is using jet aircraft. So is it ridiculous to talk about chemtrails in the sky being part of geoengineering? Absolutely not. It's being discussed in a very serious format here in NASA at the Jet Propulsion Lab about how to mitigate climate change, what to do about it, what's being discussed. And he goes on to talk about all the negative consequences that they know can happen from this. There are a lot of issues. One is it's known from looking at volcanic eruptions and this cooling effect that you get uneven heating and you actually cause drought in some areas. So country A decides to do geoengineering and they cause a drought in country B. You know, the missiles start flying. Um, what happens if we stop it abruptly? If, if we can't get control of CO2 and we start you know, injecting stuff in the stratosphere, it's costing us $10, $10 billion a year and we have an economic meltdown or a natural disaster or a volcano erupts and we can't fly airplanes for a while. What happens if that shield is removed quickly? We rapidly jump up in temperature. And even greater than that is the fact of what we call instability in the system. If you whack a bell, it rings for a while. The concern of the climate system ringing like a bell and being unstable. But we're going to see this not only has consequences for the environment, but for who gets to control the environment, what that means for global power. Those are some of the most important questions. Now watch what he says here. And there are other issues. What about weaponization? If you grew up watching the Six Million Dollar Man and the Bionic Woman like me, and remember there's an episode where the bad guy builds a weather machine and he's you know holding all the governments hostage. Well, this is not science fiction anymore. It really could work. Not to mention the distraction of spending cost and who are, and then again, arguments over the thermostat. Whose hands on the thermostat, right? Look how hard it is to get international agreements on anything. They know it can do everything from cause drought to cause global disagreements. It can empower a rogue individual to unilaterally control the atmosphere, maybe plan out a Dr. Strangelove or James Bond kind of mad scientist hostage situation. If it's perceived to be cheap and effective, then in the words of Dr. Strangelove, it merely requires the will <laughs> of, of trying this, right? And, and the perception of this could lead to unilateral action. And don't take my word for it. Listen to the World Economic Forum. Every year they put out a risk assessment. Just a couple of weeks ago they put out a risk assessment and they listed five wild cards or X, X factors for the 21st century. Rogue geoengineering was one of those. This is The Economist and the business leaders worrying about somebody taking rogue action. He literally said from NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratories that a legitimate concern is the weaponization of geoengineering. What happens if a mad scientist holds the planet hostage? I'm just gonna play it again. What about weaponization? The bad guy builds a weather machine and he's you know holding all the governments hostage. Well, this is not science fiction anymore. That's right, the top globalists are worried about unilateral action with geoengineering because they know testing is underway. They count on the public's ignorance and we're stuck debating whether or not geoengineering is going on, whether or not the chemtrail phenomenon is really what the conspiracy theorists think it is. And here's NASA talking about we're concerned about rogue geoengineers. We're concerned about a mad scientist hostage situation. We're worried about the Dr. Strangeloves who were partially in private sector, partially inside secret parts of the government. Weather modification programs, experimental ones done by private companies, done by the United States government, uh, done by states across the United States are underway. There's more than 50 of them in operation across the United States. None of these programs that I know of today, and this is all public record, are available at any time uh, with oversight, agricultural oversight or public oversight. 
These programs impact agriculture, and there are programs around the world, international corporations the economy. are modifying our weather all the time. The policy is there. The ideas of using albedos, solar radiation management for geoengineering are there. But who's involved? Well, here's the business insider talking about the CIA wanting to control weather through geoengineering. And once something like geoengineering goes through secret channels of government, once it becomes a matter of national security, the public's ability and, quote, right to know goes straight down the tubes. And we see as well that indeed the CIA is co-sponsoring geoengineering studies, and so are a lot of private individuals. The CFR has been talking yes. about since 2008 the issues with unilateral geoengineering and the consequences of rogue individuals uh, taking hold of the technology. And the particulates that are being seeded into the atmosphere, and this, this data is there, and again, why is all this so much more important than everything else happening in the world, all the political theater, because the biosphere is the bottom line, the absolute bottom line to our survival. Tiny particles have outsized impact on storm clouds and precipitation. Listen carefully to this as you consider what's going on above your head day in and day out. Tiny particles fuel power, powerful storms and influence weather much more than has been appreciated, according to a study in the January 26 issue of Journal Science. The research focuses on the power of minute airborne particles known as aerosols. What have I stated over and over? This is what geoengineering is about, stratospheric aerosol injection which can come from urban and industrial air pollution, wildfires and other sources. How about the jet aircraft in front of our faces day in, day out? How about that source ignored by academia and all power structure owned institutions, blatantly ignored, the insane asylum we live in, that people pretend this isn't going on above our heads, that academia that is completely betrayed, largely, with few exceptions, betrayed the human race and the entire web of life as they continue to pretend that climate engineering is not going on over our heads. This report continues. In this study, scientists examine the role of ultrafine particles less than 50 nanometers. This is an engineered particle, exactly what's called for in climate engineering patents. But this science source, like all others, pretends it's some sort of natural phenomenon. But scientists had not observed until now the smaller particles below 50 nanometers. They didn't know until now, really. How come the rest of us knew? How come we knew at geoengineeringwatch.org, but these massive science sources didn't know? It's just like the clouds that they now name, about a dozen and a half cloud types that never existed before, but nobody ever apparently noticed before, and it's pushed in our schools by official agencies like NASA to indoctrinate our children into thinking that this is somehow natural and benign and not harmful to them. What a sick, twisted society, just like the vaccinations I covered at the beginning of this broadcast, sick and twisted when so-called healthcare providers and mainstream media liars push this on populations as if this is something good for you, something healthy, something you have to do. And populations who blindly accept this, where is their sense of reason? Where's their sense of responsibility to the whole? Where's their sense of responsibility to their children? Where is it? A headline from multiple sources. The Trump administration is lifting key controls on toxic air pollution. Does anybody care? When, when people are pretending that, that this latest puppet face in the White House is somehow going to cure everything? What a delusional notion. Totally delusional notion. I'm sorry if that's offensive to anybody who loves Trump. Why is the EPA claiming that six greenhouse gases emitted from jet planes are a threat to human health under the Clean Air Act while doing nothing to address ongoing lawsuits over leaded aviation gasoline or the real health concerns of stakeholders worldwide? Cancer causing heavy metals and fuels and their additives <clears throat> and aviation induced cloudiness. You, the EPA, claim the authority to regulate aviation emissions under the Clean Air Act, a law that should protect us from the aforementioned poisonous pollution. However, the definition of pollution is being perverted to mean climate change gases in what can only be called a violation of the spirit of the law. Air pollution which may reasonably be anticipated to endanger public health or welfare. That's the quote. 
As you can see by the wording in the Clean Air Act, lead, barium, aluminum, and trade secret toxic chemicals clearly present a greater danger to public health than greenhouse gases, no matter how much climate science you accumulate. Furthermore, material safety data sheets of aviation fuel and their additives almost always contain the same warning, do not dump in water. Yet, raw fuel dumping or burning these chemicals, dangerous chemicals and then dumping them in water is somehow safe. Finally, despite great efforts to find bioaccumulation or biomagnification studies on precipitated aviation pollutants, none seem to exist. The EPA and Obama administration are ignoring the global outrage over the most visible climate change concern from airplanes, cloud creation. Do a search for the word chemtrails on the internet and you will see millions of concerned citizens who look up and wonder what in the world are they spraying. Despite what you may think of the myriad of maladies attributed to these clouds, the global outrage is nonetheless clear. They are right to be worried and we should all be concerned. The EPA's claim that CO2 is a greater threat to human health than contrails and aviation-induced cloudiness is based on incomplete IPCC data that downplays the effects of contrails on our climate. The IPCC's fourth, fourth assessment of contrail radiative forcing only accounted for linear contrails meaning any contrail that spreads out and turns into cirrus clouds was not accounted for. How significant is this heat-trapping contrail conundrum? Quote, Contrails formed by aircraft can evolve into cirrus clouds indistinguishable from those formed naturally. These spreading contrails may be causing more climate warming today than all the carbon dioxide emitted by aircraft since the start of aviation. Another researcher stated, a single aircraft operating in conditions favorable for persistent contrail formation appears to exert a contrail-induced radiative forcing some 5,000 times greater than the estimates of the average persistent contrail radiative forcing from the entire civil aviation fleet. Although this research has now been incorporated into the IPCC computer models and revised down, in my opinion, these claims highlight gaping holes in climate science. As of 2013, quote, aerosol cloud interactions are, the, are one of the main uncertainties in climate research. Scientific understanding of how contrails transition into cirrus clouds is severely lacking but rapidly evolving with the latest research showing that cirrus clouds are filled with metal aerosols from human sources. Quote, the big one we found is lead, coming from things like tetraethyl lead in fuels, still used today in light aviation. So that's probably the biggest metal that we find, or the most frequent metal that we find. But we find a whole host of different metals, actually. Apparently, small amounts of metal particulates have major effects on cirrus clouds. Quote, it would seem that you would have to change all of the aerosol in the atmosphere very radically to get a big difference on big effect on the clouds, but because mineral dust and metallic particles are such a small amount of the particulate matter, just a percent or two, it means that you only have to change about a percent or two of the particles to get a big effect on these clouds. The latest research casts doubts on the IPCC's contrail assumptions and requires serious consideration when addressing the real climate change impact of aviation. High altitude metals and cirrus cloud condensation nuclei are likely coming from leaded avgas and jet exhaust. Contrails are making cirrus clouds and small changes in atmospheric metal have large impacts on cirrus cloud creation. Cirrus clouds trap heat and are likely to have a greater impact, climate change impact than CO2. Finally, aviation induced cloudiness endangers future growth in solar energy, affects tourism, and spending, and is projected to make terrestrial astronomy impossible by 2050. Geoengineering scientists, NASA, NOAA, FAA, USDA, DOE, and international corporate partners are discussing the use of biofuels and sulfur-doped jet fuels for contrail control. This cirrus and cirrus cloud seeding with bismuth, bismuth triiodide to melt these clouds away. The EPA should be directly involved in these discussions. As a result of these recent filings, I 
findings, I strongly encourage the EPA to consider expanding the scope of this endangerment to include metal particulates and cloud formation from jet exhaust. If the EPA complies with the spirit of the Clean Air Act, they will protect us from metal aerosols attributed to Alzheimer's, autism, cancer, and a plethora of other debilitating illnesses. If the EPA is truly concerned about aviation-induced climate change, they will regulate the production of contrails and cirrus clouds, which change our climate to a much greater extent than the sum of the six greenhouse gases named in this proposal. Regulating heavy metals and aviation-induced cloudiness will be meaningless without proper verification. Even though ICAO members sign a binding agreement to only use certain chemicals in their gas tanks, we all know agreements and regulations are useless without proper verification. Therefore, I request mandatory, random testing of jet exhaust be immediately implemented. This is the most important step the EPA can, ta can take to law, do its due diligence to protect us from harmful pollution and get real world data to improve future regulations. Most of the data behind this endangerment finding comes from research in highly controlled environments where vari most variables are known. We need verification of non-ideal situations where fuel fouling, fame contamination, or improper maintenance end in vastly different exhaust particulates than seen in lab settings. To achieve verification, I propose that the EPA randomly attach a trailing probe to both foreign and domestic flights then collect and analyze the results to determine real-world exhaust constituents. Alternatively, ground-based LIDAR observations may be possible over fixed high-traffic areas and prevent possible terrorist attacks using aerosols. Either way you choose, we need verification and protection. In conclusion, the EPA should expand this endangerment to include metal aerosols and cloud creation, create a verification system that includes all aircraft, protects us from aviation pollution, holds violators accountable, and commits to better scientific accuracy for future determinations. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of so many who could not be here. Um, and thank you for listening to a, a layperson's views um, on this subject. While I appreciate the efforts of the Center for Biological Diversity, the Sierra Group, and the Friends of the Earth to get the EPA to hold the aviation industry accountable, the poor people like myself have to live near these airports, under these fuel dumps, and under these clouded skies. I hope that some faith can be restored in our EPA by your action here and now. Tell the ICO, ICAO that they will meet your demands and our demands, not the other way around. Thank you.